you see a massive shift and I think how people are perceiving upper education too. We're seeing massive declines in people actually applying to upper education as a whole because they're seeing other options that are more viable for them. And of course, naturally with the education gap and within the minimum, the minimum wage gap that's happening, of course, occurring, it's just, it's so expensive to go to university or college and a lot of families, it's really difficult for them. Naturally, there's, there's very little support. Welcome to Business Ninjas, brought to you by Write For Me, where you'll hear from business leaders who are out there growing their business and slaying it every day. Learn from the masters. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Business Ninjas. I'm here today with Mark Rotensteiner, Director of the Agency at the University of Florida. Mark, how are you doing today? Good, thanks. Appreciate it, Andrew. Thank you for having me today. I'm oh, excited. It's my pleasure. We're, we're excited to have you here on Business Ninjas. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and about the agency at UF. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again. Yeah, so we're a little, a little bit of a unique uh, offering, a little bit of a unique concept. We're part of the University of Florida, so we're a teaching hospital methodology with our students being part of the agency can see experiencing advertising and marketing for our commercial clients with oversight from professional oversight from professional staff. So very similar to what you would see on the teaching hospital methodology, where you have uh, professionals who are overseeing the medical side, very similar fashion here. And so what we've started to create is we identified when we first started this program, there's a big problem in advertising and marketing naturally with, of course, junior level talent coming into the industry as a whole. There's a lot of you know, both on the brand side and on the company side, it's really difficult to identify some really great talent. Naturally within that, even thinking about long-term internships or thinking about some of the typical processes that we see every day, it's, it's very cumbersome naturally. And it's very difficult for businesses to find the best talent. On top of that, for internships, you know, you have really typically a short period of time, even whether it's a three month or even a long-term six month, you find that a lot, of, we find a lot of times that brands don't feel like it's enough time, one. And two, on the flip side of that, as a as an employee and as an intern, it's also the opposite as well, where employees also feel like they don't get enough feedback during that time period because it's too short. And they also feel like there's not enough time to iterate or to become a better employee as a whole. And so in a sense, really both sides feel that it's, you know, it's a it's a band-aid and it's it's helping to some extent. But within that, it's really difficult to identify if this is really going to be a great fit for both sides on the on the market. So we started to create this program to create opportunities for our students who are currently in, in going through their upper, upper education, whether it's undergrad or graduate level, to start to experience what marketing advertising might look like before they even go in the industry. So that way they learn exactly what areas they want to go into the industry, specifically in what niche groups, but also so they understand too what are some of the best moments and some of the best ways companies, brands, whether they want to go Asian stat, et cetera, and start to create those experiences now. And so within that, we do quite a bit of work with, up to, we do small, small to medium-sized businesses, up to Fortune 50 brands and everything in between. We've done work internationally, nationally, uh, and we kind of hit really all, we're, we're considered a full service. We do everything from research to full creative production, graphic design elements, photography, videography, et cetera, and into motion graphics, website development, mobile app development. So we truly are full service here. Um, and it's been a really exciting program. And, and I kind of joined the program helping oversee long-term strategy, helping oversee and manage the, the larger agency as a whole, and then start to help us think through what does that look like for client success. Um, and as we start to build the agency much more, we're, we've been really lucky in the past few years to be recognized internationally and recognized across uh, both our client groups, but also in a few award shows and a few uh, big networking and professional groups. So it's been a really exciting process. I think for us, we're just really excited to see our students and our team grow from the experience and then go into some really amazing uh, positions after the fact. So it really is all about our student outcomes the entire time. I, I love the concept. I mean, it makes sense on both sides of the equation at such a high level. Internships are interesting, but in the world of advertising, it's a very high pressure situation. They're very, you got one shot at it. And, and um, I imagine they're not quick to give as much responsibility to as an intern as they might in a situation like this. Exactly. So, what was your path to this world? Did you go through the program yourself? Yes, I did actually. I was uh, when I was undergraduate here at University of Florida. I, we were just starting the program for the first time, so I was in it for a very short period. From there, I went to Washington D.C. for um, some lobbying. At the time, I was a lobbyist for a pretty large international firm helping represent foreign governments and foreign entities. Did that for a little bit of time, and then came back um, actually at, at a request from our current 
administration here looking to kind of rethink what this program could look like and also rethink also as you know naturally the market changes quite rapidly in our field specifically typically as many of us know as the economy goes really well or goes really bad marketing and advertising is usually the first industries to typically get that hit to some extent and so really thinking about being nimble and thinking about different business models that are of course being adaptive agile with those market changes especially over time so that's the biggest area that we've been focusing in on that's really why i came in during a big shift in 2018 where a lot of budgets were changing a lot of the big networks uh were doing well but there was shifting to more boutique agencies a lot of brands were looking for, to get out of a big network or looking to try to find a more dedicated team that uh felt like they were they were the you know the biggest client in the room or they were the most important people in the room and so that's really where we started to shift some of our mentality as well and and that continues to change naturally it's a pendulum across the larger market for us as you can see across advertising you'll see the big networks do really well for about five or ten years and then it will go back to boutique and then it changes usually back again and it just kind of continues back to that same path i think it never necessarily will change but i think what we're seeing now in recent times is some big shifts in how brands are thinking about agencies and how they identify those and how they bring them into a larger platform as a whole or within their larger brand, especially as more channels come up, more interactions with consumers come up. And really now that everything's digital, a brand has to be really careful about what they and how they interact with that consumer. It's it's really no matter where they're interacting with you, whether it's email or social or even in store um, or e-commerce, et cetera. I mean, it's every instant of moment is a digital you know, historical record. And so that becomes a big moment for them and it becomes risky, but a lot of times we help brands kind of try to find that risk and see it as an opportunity to really excel and, and find the moments to be the most creative and find the moments to be the most um, exciting. So that's really, it's difficult, but it's a fun game right now that's happening. Um, and we'll see, of course, how it continues to fold uh, in the next few years. That risk factor has definitely increased in the last few years. It takes more and more touch points to, to get and retain a customer in just about any industry today. I think people do more research and are, are closer to the vest with their money and their time and their energy than ever before. And you, you said something about clients wanting to be the most important in the room. Uh, you, you describe every client in every client uh, service relationship there is, right? They always right. want to be, the most, and, and it's an Absolutely. important thing to stress. Absolutely. What What's the origin story? What when did this program begin? And I'm unaware of, of programs like this. Are there more yeah. like this around the country? Yeah, it's a great question. We started here in 2015, uh, uh, based in the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, within that, there are a few other programs that popped up actually around the same time. The biggest difference, I think, is again, we're also where upper education is as well. It's not only is it changing in the commercial space for marketing and advertising, but upper, upper education is changing quite rapidly in the way that we're teaching and thinking about these structures for our, our future talent and our junior talent going into the industry as a whole. So back in 2015, there was a big push to bring in more uh, immersion experiences and in trying to find that that sweet balance between upper education and trade school. Naturally, there's a lot of benefits for both, and there really isn't really one or one over the other. They never will be. They're, they're fantastic options on both sides. Trying to find those moments, though, where a, a individual, a, a person can find those moments that are best for them and can grow in their own unique way, their own style of learning, their own way that they want to grow their career or themselves professionally. At that moment in 20, 30, 2015, when we first got started, the conversation around immersion became much more of a larger conversation across upper education. And as you would imagine, upper education, upper education moves pretty slow. So when those conversations first start, it takes us a while to start to make those edits or start to make those iterations and bring that into our systems as a whole. Within that, there's a few other programs across the US that are very similar, but they're more student focused. So we have a few programs that typically don't have the oversight or the structure in place like we do here. That usually includes maybe one faculty advisor or one professional staff member. And you have a larger student team that's doing a lot of that work independently from a professional on staff or from an oversight as a whole. And what we found when we first started talking through that transition from going from upper education into the market as a whole, there's a huge lack of uh, experience and a huge lack of training, of course, that comes into that. And so that model of being able to mentor and to being able to train junior level talent to get to a senior level role in a commercial environment is just so tricky because you have 20 million things to get done for your clients, for your brands. You have, you know, you're trying to make profit. You're trying to, you're trying to accomplish really everything on the to-do list and then also mentor a junior team member. 
junior team member, it's quite a quite difficult for many. And so helping, we start to identify what if we start to that process earlier. And that's where we have our professional staff. We're one of the only programs in the nation that has uh, close to six full-time professional staff that come from industry in different areas, whether it's creative, strategy, research, uh, accounts, et cetera. So within that, our full-time staff are overseeing, we're managing, we're helping get the work expectations up to the level that a typical agency would expect or a typical brand would expect without having to rely on a client or having to rely on a brand to provide that that junior mentoring ship uh, aspect. And so that's been, we've been the most profound and most um, proud of our work that, in that space specifically. And that's really what's been really exciting is we've now seen a high percentage of our students getting beyond entry level roles from our program because they're starting that process earlier. And that's, we're seeing a lot of HR departments across Google, across VML, YNR, which is a very large international agency, uh, across very large networks as a whole, start to qualify our program as real world experience because they see it as truly our team is understanding what how the market works. They're working interact, we're working across a larger portfolio naturally. And they're of course executing on work that's going in market, whether it's in the US or internationally as well. That's excellent. Now, if I understand correctly, the vast majority of the people in the program are paid. It is like a teaching hospital, like a residency sort of thing. So they are learning and earning at the same time. And frankly, they have skin in the game. Tell exactly. me what, what sort of percentage of the program are purely students versus paid employees? Yeah, it's a little bit, it's right now we're at 55%, 60%. It, it does change in ebb, of course, as clients are coming in and out and after as our products are changing here and there. I think the biggest thing for us and, and also to that same point around upper education, of course, the the hard part is upper education is always going to be two steps behind commercial practice every single time. However, trying to find ways that we can become and better fix that gap or make that gap smaller. One of the biggest areas here in, in Florida specifically is there's a lot of laws around labor practices, specifically when it comes to education. And that's really interesting and tricky because we actually have a lot of regulations around how what students we can pay and how many we can pay based on what hours they're taking or what credits they're taking for the course load. So it's become this really, really weird gray area where, of course, as an upper education uh, group and as a, as a entity, and then part of the University of Florida, which we are, we are public, so we are part of the government, we become this very, very, very so gray area that we try to find what that, that means. And it, unfortunately, because of the structures in place with education, which are, are great, but also a hindrance to how commercial practices, we have to, unfortunately, we move a little bit slower. So that's the one thing that we're, we're really actively working on not only across Florida as a whole, but these are starting conversations in our, our program specifically, but also many other programs that are similar, like teaching hospitals that have a similar practice or similar methodology, are having a lot of conversations on a national and federal level to start to think about how are these laws really the most equitable for all of those involved, specifically our students who are going through this process. And so, so there's a few laws that are unfortunately that are still in the books that are just making it very tricky to get around and trying to make it and make it very tricky on how we can best support our team and, and make that equitable across the board. And that's that's really really going to be, I think, a big conversation in the next few years in upper education and also the government as a whole. Very, very interesting. Uh, obviously, there are there's a, a completely different dynamic when it comes to learning medicine, right? There has always been this machine of residency and paid residence and all that kind of thing because there's a perception that it's so much more an important path than calling. But hey, every profession should have a pathway where there isn't such a gap in information and experience between university and job. There has to be some real world exposure and, and some education and income. Exactly, exactly. I think within that too, I mean, you see a massive shift and I think how people are perceiving upper education too. We're seeing massive declines in people actually applying to upper education as a whole because they're seeing other options that are more viable for them. And of course, naturally with the education gap and within the minimum, the minimum wage gap that's happening, of course, occurring, it's just, it's so expensive to go to university or to college. And a lot of families, it's really difficult for them. Naturally, there's there's very little support. So I think what we're finding is that there's, there, and we're seeing some from the research across the US, um, we're seeing a, a, a larger decrease every year, year over year, of people choosing upper education as a education source because there are really fantastic trade schools. There are some really fantastic skills that you can honestly learn now on YouTube, on LinkedIn, you know, across the board as a whole. 
and tick on TikTok, especially TikTok has a lot of great content coming out now where it's this information sharing across individuals that you can start to pick up industry knowledge or industry trends and start to see what how that how that fits for your what you're looking to do in your own life and in your own personal growth. And we're also seeing a large shift in college dropouts as well. Same thing. They're seeing some really great parts about university that they're that they love, but then realizing you know one or two years in that maybe it's either not a good fit or they might not need the next one or two years. And so they there's this interesting shift in consumer behavior on the education side that I think is starting to to help in a good way educators, especially those that are in administration, understand how we can better impact the education process and how upper education needs to actually change some of our processes to match what's really in need for an everyday consumer and for an every, every not even consumer, but an everyday person and helping their own personal growth become who they really want to be. All right, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your clients. Uh, what verticals are the agency serving? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, so we're, we've almost hit pretty much almost every vertical to some extent. I mean, we do quite a bit in tech right now where we do a lot of uh, direct to consumer work, e commerce work specifically across e commerce platforms. So Amazon, you know, the large ones, Walmart, Target, CBS, et cetera. Uh, we do quite a bit of work with other uh, entertainment brands, uh, Fortune 50 brands as well. Um, we have a large partnership and we're really excited to share our partnership with Disney, uh, which has expanded across multiple brands uh, that includes Hulu, ESPN, and we have a few uh, clients that we work with across the board too, um, and in different spaces, Carnival Cruise Lines on more of the tourism side. We have clients that we've worked with previously, like McDonald's on the QSR space, um, and a few other, Chick-fil-A as well, a few others that are kind of across the board as a whole. And then we also have many other clients, Bliss, including myself, which is actually behind me, but our skincare brand, a very large uh, partner with us that we're super excited to work with. So we really hit almost every single industry and every single vertical. Those do not sound like uh, internship, get your feet wet kind of clients that you're right. talking about. You're right, exactly. I mean, it, it, it's high pressure and it's, it is certainly, it's, it's high, there's high expectations. Our work itself, a lot of times it's strategy work and consulting work, but we also do a significant amount of execution in market. So that includes high quality content that, you know, is expected from a New York agency or from a LA or Chicago agency. So we find that our, our students, once you start to create those moments where there are, is support, there's certainly, there's the, certainly they'll meet the, they'll, they'll meet the expectation without a doubt. And I think that's the, the exciting part is kind of a shift in this understanding of what a student might mean moving forward as uh, society keeps growing and it keeps getting more integrated, that idea of a student becomes more of a practitioner, that line starts to shade a little bit more. Um, and so, yeah, we've been really excited and excited to see what that future looks like. It, it's, it's obvious what differentiates you from other learning institutions and organizations. What differentiates you in the open market from other agencies? What, 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 what draws people to the agency at UF as a client? Yeah, absolutely. We do a ton of Gen Z work naturally. But we also do a lot of general, what we call general market or general audience work as well. So that goes into even older demographics, quite a bit of work around there. We've done work with retirement homes. We've done work with um, many telephone companies that are more geared towards older demographics as well. But typically it will start around a Gen Z conversation. A lot of our brands actually come to us where they feel like they're either outside of culture or they're not quite, they feel like they've just hit the outside of culture. So Prime example would be a few clients that we've had um, that they they were once really entwined with culture, a household name, very big understanding of who they are. And then over a few years, you know, they've kind of take a step back or culture has just moved a bit faster than their brand itself. And they feel like they've lost touch with their general consumer. They feel like they've lost, they don't feel like a household name anymore. And so we help them kind of bring the, their brand back into reality, help them understand what call culture can move their brand forward, but also how can they naturally be part of the conversation as a whole. So that's a majority of our work naturally. A lot of our work also is looking for very out of the box creative where the nice part, what we what we really talk about with our clients is that because our students, because our team is new to the market, they have a lot of that. They have very less fear. There's more confidence. There's more excitement in doing out of the box and doing and pitching very weird out of you know crazy, crazy concepts because there isn't the fear of this might not work or because um, you know this is this is, could be a very different career path for me. For them, they're really exploring and, and really excited to. Um, really pitch anything that's out there and put their mind to what could be in the future. And that 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 energy 
that level of excitement, that level of collaboration is really what our clients strive for. And so we find that a lot of agencies and a lot of brands actually come to us because we are so open and so collaborative across our, our spots and across our, our work that they don't typically find that energy when you're you know working with a seasoned professional who you know has has scars of legal <laughs> review and you know 20 million things that they could get past in the, in the future so uh yeah it's been exciting pitch traumatic stress disorder yeah. exactly exactly <laughs> <laughs> it's funny I, I i watch commercials on a regular basis because you know the vast majority of commercials now are as snarky and sarcastic and bizarre as you could possibly get and you think what were the 20 ideas at that table that were shot down that this is the one that made it? And, and I guess your young fertile minds are uh, throwing some interesting things against the wall in, in these pitch meetings. You're completely right. And I think a lot of that too is it's also an interesting change in Gen Z as a whole, as a consumer base and as a generation, where also we find a lot of brands and a lot of agencies find it difficult to say, to raise their hand and say, this doesn't feel right, or this doesn't work with our audience. Uh, and so we see a lot of brands, you know, making pretty drastic mistakes over the past few years. And a lot of it's because of this culture that's just inherent within all of us. We don't necessarily want to ruffle the feathers. We don't want to change the way that systems currently work. And that's, it's difficult for some of our older generations and ones that that's kind of been entwined in us since early development, since we were first in our, you know, in elementary school, et cetera. What I'm finding, which is really interesting is our Gen Z generation is very, very, very different in that. There are certainly those same trends naturally. It's not, you know, black and white. It's not significantly different almost overnight, but there are some significant trends that we're seeing in consumer behavior and how they think that is certainly they're willing and they absolutely will raise their hand in a meeting and say, this doesn't feel right. And we need to reimagine this or we need to rethink this or call this out as we should be cautious of what this might look like because it could uh, offend a specific audience group or because we're not in being inclusive of other audience groups. So, and it creates this really interesting and fantastic energy I think within that, naturally, we have a lot of clients who also would come to us because of that energy. They feel like they have a, a true uh, team that will tell them exactly what they think and tell them exactly what they feel, no matter what the reper repercussions are, whether you know we lose that client or we not. I think that's the part that we really strive to create a culture around here too. We're willing to lose clients because we want to tell them the truth. We want to tell them that this might not work and, and this could become a, a larger crisis as a whole, or it could become a larger problem and trying to, to accomplish what you're looking to accomplish. Hey, your your partners need to trust you and that when they ask you a question, the answer is legitimate, not some third and fourth hand guessing of what you think you're supposed to be saying. It's important. I mean, look, we, we live in a very sensitive time. Uh, perception is everything. And uh, you, you're in the business of, of helping people establish or reestablish their brand recognition. It's an important relationship. They have to be able to trust the answers to the questions. They pose. Yeah. Hey, Absolutely. in any relationship, right? But especially in this one. Yeah. What role has content played in the growth of the agency at UF? It's huge, huge. I mean, to your point too, I mean, just around that, as they, as our consumer audience get more integrated across multiple channels and across multiple touch points, content is key to everything. I think what we're seeing, which is really interesting, the algorithms are starting to change drastically. We're seeing this with, you know, multiple articles coming out with Wall Street Journal, for example, around Google's algorithm you know, is starting to lack or starting to cave in terms of some of its content because there's just so much information out there. And then you see and start on channels, social channels. Each of those individual channels in those companies are creating very interesting and very specific uh, algorithm parameters to either promote very type, various types of content or even de-promote other types of content as a whole. So you start to see each channel has a slightly different strategy of what type of content they're looking to to cultivate on their own platform, which is creating some really interesting moments and cultural moments per platform, which I think is something that we talk about significantly with our clients and trying to see what makes sense when it feels the most natural for them. Content, of course, I think will always be key. And I think the biggest part too, as we move forward and the continued changes on how we see content creators, the, the market and the business around that, I find that now is actually the perfect time and the best time for content creators. However, it's the also hardest to create a living as being a content creator uh, when it comes to a, a traditional sense of a social media or when it comes to traditional sense of, of what content production looks like for a content creator specifically. I think within that, there are, again, a lot of changes that are happening with the algorithms and there's a lot of changes. YouTube just even two weeks ago uh, recently cha massively changed the way they see uh, metrics for payment for their uh, content curators and content creators. 
And that's all we're seeing very similar changes happening on other social platforms as well. Getting outside of even traditional and into non-traditional means in terms of content creation, we're seeing a lot of brands get excited and want to experiment much more with different mediums and so what you're seeing a lot with you know threads and the, in, in the increase that comes in with all these new different platforms whether or not they stay i think it's less of a, a conversation for us as marketers it's more of the excitement around the curiosity the willingness to explore the willingness to experiment from these brands that we're starting to see mindset mindset shifts across how they perceive marketing how they perceive interacting with their consumer bases i think that's a really exciting time a lot of times as marketers we naturally will see a new platform come up or a new medium. I mean, we've been talking about AR and VR for you know over a decade now in multiple facets. And it's still not necessarily, I would say it's still not necessarily full mainstream. Of course, there's multiple moments that you are going to see it, uh, of course, come into play, but it's still, you know, it's a it's a big budget. The only really big brands can really handle a, an ask like that or a project like that. But within that, I still think that there's going to be moments where you start to find those nuggets that become part of the experimental process across all content. So whether it's a true AR or VR, it's still coming into social content, still coming into thought leadership, still coming into long form and short form content. And it's coming into a lot of different areas that are both traditional and non-traditional. So the part that we get really excited about, and I think where the future of content's going is that experimental, that excitement around it, where brands are experimenting. And if it, even if it does fail, they get excited that they even tried it in the first place. I also think consumers are seeing that, especially Gen Z. And they are celebrating brands, even if it does fail. Hey, you tried it. It was interesting. Like we even tried it with you to some extent. The hard part that we have, or a lot of times that we we try to help brands understand, is providing those forms or providing the foundation for a consumer to take that journey with you on a new medium or a new platform, rather than it being about you as a brand and you over simplifying or, or trying to talk for them, trying to talk at them. It has to be a collaborative moment. If it's not collaborative, a consumer just They'll, they'll find something else, especially Gen Z now where we have so many channels and so much content constantly at us. It, you know, we'll just shut one content piece down if it doesn't suit us or if it doesn't feel natural, doesn't feel right and move to another. So it's it's this interesting um, moment, I think for sure that, that will start to grow even more so. Hey, it's an exciting and challenging time. I, re I really appreciate the fact that an organization like yours exists. I can see the appeal to a company because Who's going to have more of their sense, you know, their finger on the pulse of what's going on right now than an organization like yours that is teaching and educating and working at the same time? You guys are the demographic that they're going after in the first place, so there's that. Uh, so really, kudos to the to the, the the concept and and execution of the plan there at UF. That's that's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate Look down it. the road a year. What are some things you'd like to be celebrating personally and professionally? Yeah, I think we want to continue to have that conversation largely across the market, uh, especially in the marketing advertising space around junior talent entering the marketplace. We're seeing some great changes occurring, a lot of with our partners specifically that we're working with. And we are some, seeing some great changes across uh, and some programs that are happening within the trade associations that are occurring within our space specifically. But I think what we're starting to see still is a, a large gap in what that transition looks like naturally. And it, it, some of it is it will never be fixed, to be honest. I mean, our business models, especially on marketing and advertising side, were very much so around effort. And of course, how we charge or all of our rates or how we charge on in our business models are the, the way that they interact. And so between that, a lot of companies naturally are always going to want to look for a work an employee who already has as much know-how and less education needed before going into or training needed before going into that role. And so they're trying to find ways that they can they can find those gaps and try to mitigate those gaps. What we try to do here and what we try to focus on within the larger industry is change the conversation to trying to find less of those individual gaps, but think long term. Almost think about this as a consumer standpoint. What is instead of like a customer lifetime value, what is your employee employee lifetime value? And really helping think through how those moments can actually be the most impactful for your business and really drive your business forward by putting those moments in now in app education, finding those collaboration moments here to, to, together and helping build the next future rather than being reactive and waiting for those individuals to come to you. I think we find it's it's difficult naturally. It's a little bit easier for some of the bigger brands and harder for some of the smaller brands, but we're even finding a lot of small brands and small businesses finding moments where they can collaborate together and collaborate with upper education specifically in other areas that they can really start to create that pipeline where it feels much more natural. And it 
allows skill sets to build naturally without it feeling so forced. Well, that's excellent. Really. Please tell everyone what your URL is, where they can find the agency at University of Florida, and what social media outlets you're using these days as well. Absolutely. We're on all the socials at the, the agency at UF specifically. And then also our website is theagency.jou.ufl.edu. Mark Rotensteiner of the Agency at University of Florida. Thank you for sh shedding some light on a new pathway towards launching some talented people into uh, a pathway that needs them. And I, I appreciate what you're doing. All the best to you and yours and continued success to the agency at UF. Yes, thank you so much, Andrew. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. We're super excited and, and just love the conversation as a whole. So thank you. My pleasure. Be well. Thank you.